Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Pastor's already told us that when we give, God gives us more than we pour out. God's doing that tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The book of Luke, chapter number seven. I appreciate you being in God's house. Grab your Bible or your smart device. Amen. If you haven't already, go to the Facebook page, share this or share the YouTube link. <clears throat> Invite somebody to go to church with you tonight. I think the world, just like Pastor said, is they've had enough of the politics side, so let's give them something else to put their mind to. Amen. There's nothing any greater than the Word of God. So invite someone to church. Grab your phone and go to the Facebook page, the Bible Way Assembly, and share this service and ask people to go to church with you. You never know. You might sit, meet somebody in heaven one day that I appreciate you sharing the service they found God, or, or at least a pathway to him. Amen. My family's on the road tonight, so pray for them. They're traveling this way. Jalen and Seth, Clay's coming over with them, so be much in prayer that uh, this rain, all that stuff, be no problem for them. I appreciate it. Luke chapter number 7, verse number 36. If you're there, say amen. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisees which had bidden him saw it, the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would have known who in what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors, the one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou did not it's not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. And this next verse, yeah. 
Verse 47. If you mark, if you mark anything in your Bible, you should mark verse 47. <clears throat> this verse is where you will actually witness in writing the greatest miracle of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you read it, it says, Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven. He said her sins which are many, present tense, but with the word you heard him, he said it are forgiven. You watched in the word where he just worked the miracle of forgiveness of sin. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said unto the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. I want to preach to you for just a little while this evening a message entitled Empty Bottles. Would you stretch your hands this way? Pray that God would touch us. Father, come on, lift your voice with me and let's pray. God, we love you, Jesus. God, I pray that tonight you would begin to move into the heart of every life in this building. That God, you would strengthen this preacher to preach, that God, you would anoint us to preach. I plead the blood of Jesus over my own life, Father. I pray that, Lord, no weapon formed against us would prosper, that God, every attack of the enemy would be routed by the sound of the Holy Ghost. I pray that, Lord, you would move mightily in this house tonight. Let us begin to hear what thus saith the word. Let my mind be clear. Let every word come directly from the throne of God. Every thought let it be held captive by your spirit. And, God, we're going to praise you for it. We're going to thank you for it. We're going to give you the glory for it. In the marvelous name above every name, save tonight. I'm asking you to save somebody tonight. I'm asking you to fill somebody with the Holy Ghost tonight. I'm asking you to deliver someone with the power of God tonight. I'm asking you, Lord, to do the work that your word is intended to do, God. Let it be sealed with those powers of God, with signs following them that believe. I pray me to send these orders. God, we're going to give you the glory for it. In the marvelous name of Jesus, everyone that loved him shouted amen. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Simon the Pharisee was thankful to the Lord and he had invited him to his home for a feast to show his appreciation. And it was a big thing for both Simon the Pharisee and also for this feast to go on in that particular town. It was a big thing for this to happen. Now, I've been there and those of you that's been to Israel understand that that arid, hot, dry temperature is not conducive for eating supper inside of a house, especially before the advent of air conditioning. So what they would do is people of renown or people with means, they would have a, a fence or a courtyard that was built on the outside around their house and they would prepare the meal and they would of course sleep in their house but if they had a big meal like this, uh, they would have everyone eating outside and they would have that fence uh, built around it. Most of the time it's four foot fence, uh, maybe a little bit taller uh, and they were there and, and, and inside that courtyard and that's where they would feast. One of the things that the master of the ceremonies would do is that he would invite not only a guest of honor, and in this case it was the Lord, but he would also allow even those others that were to be at the table with him to sit in, but then those that were not invited to eat at the house, they were allowed to go up to the courtyard fence and lean on the fence and watch them eat and listen to the conversation. Now, let me just tell you one thing. Don't invite me to watch you eat supper. Say amen, somebody, because I ain't coming. Amen. If you all you want me to do is watch you eat, 
I promise you, we can just let you do your thing and we'll look it up on YouTube later and see what happened. But I'm not coming to your house to watch you eat. Even, however, one of the purposes that that was allowed to do so is because this, this Pharisee, he would invite military leaders. He would invite city government. He would invite the mayor of sorts. He would bring them in, and they would have a conversation around his table, and they would talk about if it was city government or city officials. They would talk about how that they were going to expand a certain part of the city, uh, they would what they were going to work on. Uh, if it was military, the campaign of the summer, uh, all of those things were in play. Uh, they would listen to that conversation, uh, and then there were speculators uh, that would run out uh, and try to form a business to make money uh, on what was going to happen. That's what it was. Uh, it basically insider trading a little bit. Uh, that's what was going on, trying to get the jump uh, on the next big thing. Uh, friends, uh, over the years, I'm sure that this Pharisee had had many people that were there that were controversial. There were probably people that were there that were polarizing. But I want to tell you that there has never been a person that has been invited to the Pharisee's house that was more polarizing, amen, than the Lord Jesus Christ. There was none that was more divisive than the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to me, friend. You're hearing all over the news now. Let's unite. Let's come together. Let's be a family. Let's heal. Friend, if you serve the Lord Jesus Christ, those words will never be adhered to when you say to the world, let's come together. Let's heal. Let's be a family. They're not going to do it. It's not going to happen. Friend, I will tell you this. There are so many that have thought uh, that people or politicians uh, were polarizing. Uh, but here we are uh, 2,000 years after this supper uh, and we're still uh, talking about one of the most polarizing uh, people uh, in all of history. Uh, it is the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you either love him or you don't. Talk to me, somebody. There's no in-between. Well, take it or leave it. Uh, amen. Even though a lot of people try that, uh, they don't have nothing to do with him until they get sick. They don't have nothing to do with him until they get in a financial bind. They don't have nothing to do with him until they need something. And then when their prayer is not answered, they say, I told you there was nothing to him anyway. Friend, he's polarizing. Amen. He is one that you'll either love him or you'll hate him. Every time that you come to the house of God, you're making a decision about your spiritual position in the Lord Jesus Christ. Every time tonight you are, you are making a decision about whether or not you'll draw closer to the Lord or you'll step back a little bit. Every service you're making that decision. Can I tell you that the same sun that melts the butter, it also hardens the clay. You're either doing one or the other. But tonight, dear friend, there's nobody like him. There's none that's ever been like him. There's none, even though in the last days they will say, here is Christ, there is Christ. That book says, don't you believe him? Even there's only one that can forgive sins. There's only one that can wash away sin. Hey Amen. I'll never forget the story of the little Catholic lady. Amen. She went into the hospital, and that Catholic priest in that Catholic hospital uh, came in to see her. Uh, he said, I'm here to check on you. Uh, amen. And can I come in for a moment? Uh, and she said, well, of course, come in. Uh, and he said, well, I'd love to pray for you and grant you absolution. Uh, and she said, absolution. Uh, this little country woman uh, didn't know what absolution meant. He said, you know, forgiveness of sins. Uh, she said, oh, let me see your hand. Uh, amen. She reached out and thought that priest, uh, even that priest thought she was going to take his hand in and hold his hand. When she got his hand, she looked at it. She said, you're an imposter. The only one that can forgive sins has the print of the nail in his hand. You don't believe anybody else. You don't follow anybody else. There's none but Christ that can save. There's none but Christ that can deliver. Hallelujah to God. Now then, while everything was getting 
prepared. Simon the Pharisee was getting all the house in order. I can almost picture him in my mind. I've seen gentlemen just like Simon the Pharisee. I've seen them at church. Amen. I've been there. They brought me into a church uh, and they had a big supper that was going on uh, after that service and I was going to preach uh, a special service. Uh, there was this one man, uh, he was carrying flowers, uh, setting them out and fixing them and arranging them. Uh, he was making sure that the tapestries were straight. Uh, amen. Uh, he did everything like that. Uh, he marched around uh, every little old thing almost like he had a white glove. Uh, he was making sure everything was perfect. Uh, amen. The problem was uh, I didn't even see him in the church service. Uh, he never came in. Uh, he never prayed. Uh, he never talked to anybody in the service. Uh, his whole deal uh, was about being out there around the food. Uh, I know a lot of people uh, that just like Simon the Pharisee, uh, when Jesus came in, uh, he never paid him any attention uh, or said, I'll get with you in a minute, Jesus. Uh, friend, uh, let me tell you, uh, there's nothing more important uh, when you come to this house uh, than to talk to the Lord. There's nothing more important uh, that you can do besides talk to him. Amen. Simon, I'll get with you in a little bit, Jesus. Let me finish this important stuff first. We come in and think our little Sunday school class, come on now, our ministry, our singing, our preaching, whatever it is, uh, we think that's more important uh, than the presence of God. Y'all looking at me funny. Oh, Amen. There's nothing any more important than the presence of God. Amen. What do you think we're doing? We've been working from this moment all day long. We got up this morning. We prayed. We sought the face of God. You know what it was about? This moment right here. When we started this service an hour or so ago, when they began to sing the songs of Zion, it wasn't for the sake of just singing. It was to invite the presence of God. When Joel got behind that keyboard, it wasn't to show that he could sing or he's a wonderful singer. Amen. Lord knows I sound like a, a rabid dog almost tonight trying to sing. It's not about showing off who can sing or who can't. It's about inviting the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ because there's none any more important than him being here. Don't miss the miracle of his presence. Don't get caught up. That's the reason I don't sit on the back row when I visit a church. Uh, amen. I don't need to see 25 people getting up, going to the bathroom uh, while I'm trying to listen to the man preach. Uh, I'm telling you, I come to the house of God to get up there right where the presence of the Lord is going to happen. Uh, and friend, he can fill a whole house, uh, but I believe uh, he starts in the altar. Uh, I believe where that comes in. Simon didn't have any time for him. However, there was one that did have time for him. This woman in which I believe it was Mary, I believe it was the one that was caught in the very act of adultery. You can study it out. When you preach, you preach who you think it is. That's who I believe that this woman is. Matter of fact, I believe that the very reason she was in the house is because when they caught her in the very act of adultery, he meant always made me scratch my head that if she was caught in the act of adultery, why was there just one instead of two brought before them men? She was about to be stoned. She was already guilt tripped the whole way there. She was already talked about, told how worthless uh, that she was the whole time. I don't know if you've ever felt that about yourself. Uh, amen. The devil ever tried to get somebody to talk about you. Amen. To run you down uh, because every one of us have sinned. Every one of us has failed God. But now then this woman, uh, she felt guilty. Uh, she felt humiliated. Uh, she felt dirty. Uh, and nobody was helping her. Uh, they were just making it worse. Uh, sometimes I feel like uh, our churches uh, in their attempt to, to be holy, they always go overboard on the guilt tripping those that are in sin. And they seem to forget that if it wasn't for the grace of God, you would be in that same place. If it was not 
out for the grace of God. You would be somewhere in a drunken stupor. You better help me preach. Hallelujah to God. There's some of you, amen, that 10 years ago you were a drunk. 10 years ago you were on drugs. 10 years ago you were in a mess. Your relationship was broken and it was your fault. But can I tell you that when you came to Christ, he didn't put you down. He picked you up and began to deliver your soul out of the guiltiness of the flesh. <laughs> that woman had felt guilty by all of those men that wanted the stone. He said, he that is without sin cast the first stone. Amen. They all left. And he said, where are thine accusers? She said, Lord, there are none. He said, neither do I condemn thee. Go thy way and sin no more. He didn't save her then. But let me tell you something. She never forgot what it felt like to be loved by Jesus. She had felt humiliated by men her entire adult life. Talk to me now. She had been talked about, even, even those, if she was an adulteress. Amen. I can tell you, if they met her in the street days after that event had happened, they wouldn't look at her. They talked down to her. Come on, church. You can't sin and keep your head up long. But friend, once you've been delivered, you can put that head up and declare, I'm not guilty. I've been cleansed by the power of God. I'm trying to get there. God help me. That woman never could get away from the feeling that Jesus made her feel loved. I'm not here saying love the sin, but I am telling you we have to love the sinner. God help me. God help me. I, I'm a pastor. I get frustrated just like every other pastor. We mean when people that will never come to my church, uh, they'll never go to our church. Uh, they'll never walk in the door unless they need money. They need their light bill paid. Uh, amen. This past Sunday morning, uh, we had a couple walk in uh, asking everybody in my church uh, for a new tire for their car. Uh, amen. Which is a, it's a 16 rim. Uh, that's what we need. Uh, and we don't want no money. Uh, we just need a $75 tire. Come on now. I get frustrated uh, with people too uh, that that's all they want is your money, uh, your tire, whatever it is. Uh, and then they walk out uh, and uh, as if to say, uh, God, we don't really care about you. Uh, we just need stuff uh, that we can manipulate out of the church. Friend, uh, I've dealt with that as well. Uh, but let me tell you, church, uh, even though uh, amen, those folks frustrated me a little bit uh, this past Sunday morning, uh, they left our church uh, with a 16-inch tire. Come on. Come on. What's it going to hurt you? What's it going to hurt you to give somebody just a little bit of love? I know you can't give the church away. I know you can't pay everybody's rent. I know. But church, there comes a time when we got to say something. And it can only be said with the love of God. If you say it with love, they'll never get away from it. To the point, this woman... She took a chance showing up at this Pharisee's house. Right. Do you realize what could have happened right. to this woman of ill repute? Right. Showing up at a Pharisee's house, walking in the house. But she couldn't get away from Jesus. You hear me? No man has ever made me feel clean. No man has ever made me feel loved. No man has ever made me feel like I was wanted. Come on. Nobody's ever made me feel like Jesus made me feel when he told me, I'm not going to condemn you. Just go your way and sin no more. Even to the point she sought him out in a Pharisee's house. There's a, pe there's a lot of people that tell me, I ain't going to your church. It's full of hypocrites. Well, I'd rather go to church with a hypocrite than to go to hell with a hypocrite. I'm going to go where the presence of God is. I'm going to go where I can find Jesus. I'm going to go where I can find the man that didn't condemn me, but with his love, he drew me back to him. We 
that she came in. Amen. There's things that she did during that time that shows, number one, the power of repentance. The potential realized in the act of submitting your future. And then the peace that comes in worshiping Christ in the in-between time. The Bible says that that woman came in and stood behind the Lord weeping. Now, if you read commentaries, it will tell you that she didn't just run up and jump on his feet. But she stood behind him, basically asking permission if she could stoop down and worship him by washing his feet. And Jesus, come on here now, hold on to your religious hat. Jesus allowed the sinner woman to worship him. Y'all don't like that. Because Jesus just elevated a woman of ill repute to the same place as you. What are you talking about, preacher? I'm talking about he accepted the worship of a woman that was not yet saved. Woo, we don't like that at all. We don't like that at all. But the problem that folks stumble upon is that the Lord didn't just receive the worship, but he took that, and as pastor said, he gave her something back that, that was greater than she poured on him. Amen. He gave her back salvation when she came to him in humility. Talk to me now. The Bible says, humble yourself before the mighty hand of God, and he'll exalt you in due season. If you'll humble yourself, Amen. Those of you that are wind in church, those of you that are serving God, yet you failed. You've sinned. Talk to me now. You've made a mess of things. You've fallen out of the place you once were. If you come back to the same feet of Jesus Christ, he will in no wise cast you out either, but he will accept you and allow you to worship him, and he will again turn your mourning into dancing. He'll again Wash your sins away. The Bible says that that woman, when he allowed her to worship him, the first thing she did is she washed his feet with tears. Second thing she did, dried them with her hair. Third thing she did, is she broke open the alabaster box and anointed his feet. Those of you that's been to Israel understand that it's dusty and dry. We would walk out in the morning with clean clothes on. By the time you got back to the hotel at 7 or 8 o'clock at night, you would have red dirt up above your knees, around your thighs, on your trousers. He meant caked on your shoes. And we were walking in pavement uh, but and some dirt. Uh, but there was not very much concrete. There was a Roman road, but it wasn't concrete sidewalks. Uh, when Jesus walked here, it's mostly dirt. Uh, don't you know uh, that when he walked into that Pharisee's house, uh, his feet were dirty and dusty? Say amen. Yeah. Don't you know that that red dirt had caked up on his feet uh, like it did everyone else? Uh, so that woman, uh, she bowed down and the says uh, she washed his feet with her tears. Uh, now I believe she wept. Uh, there's no doubt she cried. Uh, but I don't believe she hardly uh, had enough tears uh, to weep enough uh, to wash off all the dirt uh, that was on his feet. Uh, herein it brings in to the, what we begin to talk about tonight. Uh, and that was uh, the history uh, of a tear bottle. Uh, I believe that that woman yes she wept uh, and she cried uh, but she also brought with her uh, a tear bottle. Uh, now, the history of the tear bottle, uh, the tradition, it's endured uh, for over 3,000 years. Uh, tear bottles or lacrimatoria were common in uh, ancient uh, Middle Eastern societies. Uh, even today, when we were in Jericho the last time, uh, you could buy a tear bottle. Uh, you could still buy them there. What they did uh, with a tear bottle uh, is when a person was born, uh, they were given as a gift to that family for the baby uh, a tear bottle. Uh, and that was, it was ornately decorated uh, it had a stopper much like this. And when that baby was born, that mother and that father, those grandparents, all the family around, they begin to weep with joy over that baby being born. They would go around with that baby's tear bottle and they would begin to collect 
tears off the cheeks of father and mother and off grandfather and grandmother and aunts and uncles and that was the start of the tear bottle then those babies as they got a little older you know babies when they first are born they'll cry a little bit but they don't have tears but after a while even, I don't know, five months, four months, I don't know what it is, six months, a year, uh, finally, uh, that little fella, that little lady, uh, they'll get so mad, uh, or they'll get so hungry, uh, or they'll get hurt, uh, and they'll get to crying, uh, be so upset, have a little earache, uh, until tears uh, will well up uh, on the cheeks of that baby. Uh, what that mother would do, uh, even believe it or not, uh, is when that baby's first tears uh, would roll down her face or his face, uh, they would catch those tears, uh, in the tear bottle. When that baby was older, he'd scrape his knee, come running to mama. She'd hug him and catch those tears in that bottle. When that baby boy grew up and that baby girl grew up to about 14 or 16 and fell in love for the very first time, amen, just couldn't hardly take it anymore. And then the one that they loved walked off and left them. You know that puppy love, you feel like you're going to die if you don't see them every day. They walk off and leave. That mother or that father would go get that tear bottle and collect the tears of that young girl or that young, that young boy with his heart broken. He then, and then whenever that they would finally find the love of their life, he then, they would collect the tear bottles when they married, when they got sick, even when they got older and they began to get sickly and the tears kept coming. When they started raising teenagers. Come on somebody. Hallelujah to God. And you start weeping when nobody knows that you're weeping. You're praying for them and your heart's broke when nobody understands. Come on here. They're putting tears in that bottle. I don't know about you, but I've shed a few tears over Jordan Lynette. I've shed a few tears over Jalen McKenzie. And I've shed some tears over Brian Seth. But can I tell you, those tears, they don't go unheard. The Bible says that the Lord keeps all my tears. Oh, God. They would catch all of those tears. In the Old Testament of the Bible, a reference to collecting tears in a bottle appears in Psalms 56 and 8. When David prays to God and he says, Thou tellest my wonderings, put thou my tears in thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? Can I tell you that the Lord, he collects every tear that falls from your brow, even from your cheek and your chin. The Lord has got a tear bottle. If he collected David's tears, he's collected mine. Hallelujah to God. David knows about the tear bottles in the Victorian age. Those tear bottles were also used and they were given a different type of use in the Victorian age when so many were dying from the black death and women were walking with black on all the time in a period of mourning. They came up with a tear bottle that that woman when her husband would die all the tears in that tear bottle was collected with a special stopper. Amen. It would allow the liquid to evaporate and it would only be left with the salt and when that liquid from the tears had evaporated and there was only salt that was left in that bottle it was then that the morning period was over I drove over here from Texas to tell somebody tonight that your morning period is finally over I've come to tell you that God has saw your tears he's walked with you through the heartbreak and the heartache and finally your day has come there's nothing left but salt and the Bible declared that if we're going to be effective we're going to be salt and light in this world those tears produce the saltiness that makes you effective in the kingdom of God even in the civil war Women were given bottles here in America, tear bottles, and they would weep and cry over their husband all the time he was gone. And when he would come back from war, if he made it back, they were presented with a tear bottle 
to show how much he was missed and loved and revered. You see, the tear bottle was one of the things that was a beginning and the end of a life. It represented the bookends of a man or a woman's life. Job said in Job 14, men that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. Amen. This tear bottle in that ancient period was buried with the person that it belonged to. It represented everything that had happened in their life. Not every tear that you shed is heartache tears. There's tears of joy. There's tears of happiness. There's tears of delight. But all of that is in that tear bottle. It represents your life. That woman, when she bowed down and she began to weep and wash his feet, with her tears. She said, instead of dying with this tear bottle, I'm going to live without it. Come on here, somebody. There's some of you that's carried your past. You've carried everything in your life. You've carried every broken place. You've carried it all in a bottle around, waiting to die so you can be buried with your tears. I say tonight that you don't need to be buried with it, but pour it out in a bashay on the feet of the Lord Jesus because he said in his word that he has put all things under his feet. When, when you pour out tears on his feet, he puts it under his feet and puts the past behind you. Somebody shout a minute. Somebody praise God a minute. There's some folks in this house. All you've done for a year is weep. All you've done for two months is cry. All you've had is heartache. All you've had is trouble. I say pour it out on the feet of Jesus. Pour it out on the feet of the one that can take away your past. Take away your heartache. Take away your pain. Take away the brokenness and restore you back into his kingdom. Y'all all right? She washed his feet with her tears. You see, when that woman came in there, she had a plan, Brother Joel. She had a plan. She had her tear bottle. She had her alabaster box. And she had her hair hanging down loose. Come on. There's so many people that come to church nowadays. They don't come with a plan. They don't come with a plan. They don't know what they want. Amen. They just know what they don't want. I don't want this that I've got. Well, friend, if you don't want the life you're living, you're going to have to pour it out on the feet of the Lord Jesus. If you're tired of living that way, my God, if you're tired of living in brokenness, if you're tired of living in turmoil, if you're tired of living in dispute, if you're tired of living in despair, then you've got to come to the place where you decide, I'm not going to die with these tears. I'm not going to be buried. And the bookend of my life is going to be that he wept. She wept their way to the grave. Friend, I'm not going to weep myself in the grave. I'm going to crawl up and declare that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power that works within me. That's a bullshit. She poured out the tears of her past, tears of joy. You remember when Joseph stood behind the curtain and wept over his brothers that had finally come home. Come on now. You remember that? All of that. He wept tears of joy. But what it did not say was the years that he had been separated from them. They forsook him, sold him into slavery. He had lived as a slave to Potiphar, had been in the prison he meant for years before he finally came to the palace. Church, there's some joy along the way. But to get to those few days of joy, there's been so much trouble and so much heartache. I dare you to pour it out tonight. I dare you to leave your tears on the feet of Jesus in Foley, Alabama. Don't drive shot at it. Don't drive home with the tears in tow. <laughs> Woo. Don't go home with it. Don't go home with it. 
you let it be right here. There's tears of regret you need to pour out. The Bible says Esau sought repentance and he found it not even though he sought it with tears. You got regrets poured out on the feet of Jesus. The tears of a backslider. The Bible says that there he sat and wept. In Psalms 137, uh, Israel was in Babylon. Uh, they had hanged their harps uh, on the willow tree. I don't care if you're an individual backslider tonight, uh, even of the nation of Israel. Uh, they backslid, uh, turned away from God. Not only that, uh, were turned out to pasture and scattered uh, among men all over this world. Uh, their language died. Uh, their government died. Uh, their city died. Uh, amen. They were trampled on uh, by the Ottoman sultans, but whenever the Lord said that he heard their cry, come on here, when they wept sore, when they cried unto God, he gathered them from the four corners of the earth and sat them on their feet and they lived again and the language came back, the government came back and their God came back. I've come to tell you that if you'll cry unto the Lord, pour out your tears, he will again bring you back to life. God, God help me. Come on, take about five seconds, praise him. Just say something to him. After she poured out the tears in that bottle, the Bible says that she wiped his feet with the hair of her head. Ladies, a woman's hair is her glory. Here's the thing that I know about hair. Amen. You cut off a finger, it ain't coming back. We ain't salamanders. Come on now. You cut off a hand, it ain't coming back. A leg. Right. But there's something about that hair. Matter of fact, he my, my barber, he's so good to me. I've been preaching like crazy for the last two weeks. Mississippi and then North Carolina. And I, it was a, I didn't have time to get a haircut before I left. I called him. I said, hey. I said, I hate to even ask you. I said, but before I leave town, I'm going to preach in a homeless church. If I go down there looking like Fuzzy Bear, somebody's going to wear me out. <laughs> Amen. I, I said, would you mind? He said, I got you, Pastor. After I got done with church Sunday night, slipped over to his shop. Uh, Amen. He, he gave me one that would last at least six weeks. Amen to me. <laughs> the thing about hair is you can cut it smooth down to the skin. It'll come back again. If it was there to start with, it will come back. When that woman wiped his feet with her hair, she wasn't any longer talking about her tears and her past. Hair speaks of potential. What might be, what could be. What would be? Amen. Uh, there's a lady I know that had cancer. They did the chemo and radiation, uh, and she lost all of her hair. Uh, wore a little wig for a little while. Uh, amen. And when it came back, uh, amen, it came back as curly and wavy uh, as it could be. Uh, she said, Pastor, uh, amen, paid $40,000 for a perm. I'll never forget the day, Pastor. She wore that little old wig to church. And finally, she came up to me and said, Pastor, come here. I said, what is it? She said, come down the hallway. I always get worried when little old lady starts calling me down the hallway because usually I'm about to get chewed out. I'm about to get told something. She took me down that hallway, Pastor Collie. Hey man, she said, I want to show you something. I said, what is it? She pulled that little wig out. She said, look up under there. I peeped under the wig. Now, let me tell you, pastors uh, and his congregation uh, do some weird things sometimes. Uh, hey man, uh, I peeped under that wig. Uh, hey man, I shouted with her. I said, whoa, girl, uh, it's coming on back. Uh, she said, you give me about four or five more weeks. Uh, I'm coming in here without this wig. Uh, she said, this thing's hot anyway. Uh, hey man, uh, 
I said, I'll be waiting on you. I'll never forget. Four or five weeks later, amen, she had her purse. She had a new dress. She walked in that house, baby. She was fit. And she came in when I saw her. I said, girl, you look so beautiful. That hair's coming back. Let me tell you something. When you give your tears to the Lord, you're giving him your past. But when you're wiping his feet with your hair, you're giving him your future. If you don't believe it, you ask Samson. When they cut off the seven locks of his head, amen, he had nothing, no strength, no joy, no victory. But he stayed on the grind mill until the Bible says, how be it, his hair began to grow. There's some of you been through the tears. You poured them out. And now then, the hair is coming back. Your future, your potential, you can give it to God right now in this place. You see, the reason that people go back and back and back to the altar and pour out tear after tear after tear is because they don't in the same altar service give him his tear, give him your tears and wipe his feet with your hair. If you give him both your past and your future, you won't be making that trip back to have to repent over and over and over again. She wiped his feet. Some of you's got potential in this house tonight. Some of you's got a future. Instead of just giving him your tears, tonight you need to bow down and wipe his feet with your hair. You need to say, Lord, I don't know what my future's going to look like, but whatever it is, it belongs to you. Come on, somebody. I don't know how it's going to turn out, but however it turns out, it's because I've given it to you, and all glory belongs to God. Friend, you need to give him your past, yes, but tonight, tell him, Lord, if you're going to move me to this ministry, if you're going to make me faithful on the pew of Bible way assembly until the rapture takes place, my future it's in your hand. I give you everything that I would be. That's it. One more thing she did. The Bible says that after she washed his feet with her tears, she wiped his feet with her hair, and the Bible says she had an alabaster box. She didn't take the lid off she said, I'm not going to just give him a little bit of my praise. Come on now. I'm not just going to worship him tonight while I'm feeling it. But I'm about to give him all of my worship for the rest of my life. Listen now, listen now. That girl was in the same house washing the same feet of the same Lord. The one that I just showed you the miracle later on where he said, this woman whose sins are many are forgiven. She was in the same place now, but watch what happened. Amen. After she poured out the tears and she wiped his feet with her hair, then she began to anoint him with the ointment. Amen. That alabaster box is her worship. That's exactly what it is. But look at it now. This woman is not any longer in sin. He's accepted her. Her sins and her many are forgiven. Amen. Her past is in the past. Somebody shout hallelujah. Her past is gone, but she's still in the same Pharisee's house. She's given him her future, but she hasn't seen it yet. She doesn't know when she walks out that door if that community is going to accept her. She doesn't know if the women in high society are going to ever let her in to the social club. Talk to me, friend. She doesn't know this woman is in between great sorrow and great joy. She's in the middle. And friend, what do you do when you're in between, my God? Great sorrow and not yet seen great joy. I tell you what you do. You pour out all of your worship. When you don't know where to go, when you don't know what to do, you worship.
worship, listen, worship charts a course. It tells you where you're headed. Hallelujah to God. When you're looking at the Lord, when you're walking toward him, friend, when you're worshiping him, you can't help but get closer to him. When you worship, you're drawing near. And the Bible says, draw near unto me, and I will draw near unto you. worship God. You pour out all your worship. You pour out everything. Come on, Joel. Hallelujah to God. Get on the piano. When you don't know where to go, when you don't know what to say, you worship God. That's what you do. There's some of you tonight, you're in great sorrow or in the middle between great sorrow and great joy, but you're about to worship God and he's going to bring you to the destination that he set for you. Jeremiah 29 and 11 says, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans of good and not evil. To give you an expected end. The Lord's already written the last page of the last chapter of your life. Look here. Some of you need to do what you did in high school. Amen. The book report was due. You didn't have time to read chapter 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. After all, there's an introduction, there's trouble, there's victory, and an ending. So you slipped over, amen, to the next to the last chapter, and you read how they got victory, and then you read how there was an ending. Church, I'm telling you, I dare you tonight to skip over all the chapters of heartache and pain. Pour that out to the Lord and go to the last chapter chapter tonight and declare that in him I move and have my being. I'm victorious in the Lord Jesus. Stand with me in this house. Father, I've preached my soul. I've preached my heart. God, you're talking to me and you're talking to us. There's people in this house, no doubt. That Lord, they need to pour out their tear bottle. They've carried that tear bottle for years. They've, they've carried it and carried it and carried it. They've collected so many tears until they just keep collecting and let some fall. What's the use? It'll only be more tears next week. Tonight, I challenge you, I dare you, I dare you, take that tear bottle and wash his feet with it. Pour it out tonight. Get past it tonight. Some of you are just now getting past the sin. Some of you just, in the last few weeks or months, you've got it under the blood. You're trying to do right. And you're waiting in fear, worrying about when the next time you're going to fail. Tonight, don't worry about it. Go on and give him your future tonight.